Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Amata, where as always I'm here with the latest on the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. The first thing we're going to kick things off today is that going to be something regarding the Ryzen 3000 mobile series. So before I continue with the actual, well, topic at hand I suppose you should say, just want to say this is most likely an early leak of what AMD are going to be discussing at CES 2019 as we have two sources for this particular piece of news, one of which is a Polish website, that's what I'm going to be reading from now, Google Translated of course, and the second is a Italian website, so what we have here is undoubtedly perhaps some NDAs that have been either messed up or broken or these have just leaked early or whatever. Regardless, what we actually have today is a series of Ryzen mobile processors, which of course have a built-in Vega graphics chip. So we actually have several specs here. Now, of course, take these with a pinch of salt until we see the AMD keynote, of course. But here we have the Ryzen 7 3750H, Ryzen 7 3700U, the Ryzen 5 3550H, the Ryzen 5 3500U, the Ryzen 3 3300U, the 3200U, and the Athlon 300U. But what about the actual specs, I hear you ask? Well, for the 3750H, we see 4 cores, 8 threads, 2.3 GHz base with a 4 GHz boost, a 2 plus 4 cache, so 2 L2 cache and 4 megs of L3 cache. We see up to 1400 megahertz on a TDP of 35 watts. Now, interestingly enough, the specs are actually identical on this particular website, at least, for the 3700U as well. And we kind of see a similar story across most of these, with the Ryzen 5 3500H seeing 4 cores, 8 threads, 2.1 gigahertz base, 3.7 gigahertz boost. Again, this ML2 and L3 cache and up to 1200 megahertz instead of 1400 and again on 35 watt TDP and then for the Ryzen 3s we see on the 3300U 4 cores, 4 threads, 2.9 gigahertz three, uh, sorry, for the base and 3.5 gigahertz for the boost and we see 1200 megahertz again and for the 3200U 2 cores, 4 threads, 2.6 gigahertz strangely enough on the base and 3.5 on the boost, I do wonder if that's perhaps a slight error there, but regardless, we see slightly less cache of course, we see one megabyte of L2 cache and then four megs of L3, but we do still see 1200 megahertz here. And for the Athlon 30, sorry, 300U, we see again two cores, four threads, 2.4 gigahertz base, 3.3 gigahertz boost, and up to a thousand megahertz in terms of the actual clock speed. Now we do actually have some benchmark figures here as well on this particular website where we see a 14% increase on web browsing, 27% increase on media editing, but a tie on productivity. And we also see a slight increase on games such as Fortnite, Dota 2 and Rocket League in terms of performance. We see 87 frames a second versus 73 on Rocket League, 54 versus 41 on Dota 2 and 57 versus 48 on Fortnite. But this is against a i7 8565U and they are of course using the 3700U here as an example. Now of course we should definitely wait for the keynote on this one because Obviously, this is Google Translated, and some parts of it a little bit clear, unclear, sorry, should I say. Um, just for example, the Italian website, which of course will also be linked in the description below, states that Radeon drivers will be compatible with these mobile processors. That could very much be mistranslation. Um, obviously, there's definitely finesse in translating something that Google Translate definitely lacks, so we should 110% wait for the actual announcement of these chimps at CES. Now of course I would highly expect this is not all AMD are going to be discussing at CES but I would not be shocked at all to see this um, be part of their lineup for CES 2019. But speaking of AMD we actually have something regarding Threadripper as the when the lovely Wendell from Level 1 Techs, who I actually had the pleasure of meeting when I went to Texas last year, decided to do some testing on the 29WX. Now, you may recall when this particular processor first came out, it was a bit of a disappointment when it came to in comparing against its predecessor. For example, TechSpot found that it was 35% slower in Premiere Pro, 30% slower in Handbrake, 25% slower in 7-Zip. 
um, but was faster in some instances. But basically, it was decided by the tech community almost unanimously that the issue was the memory controller configuration. But Wendell decided that, you know what, he wasn't happy with that explanation and he decided to conduct his own tests. So of course, there will be a link to his video in the description below this video, so go check that out. But he took the 29W, 29W, 2990WX, there we go, I got there at the end, it's quite a mouthful to say, I have to, I have to say. Anyway, um, he took that and the Epic chip, the 7551, and apparently a number of these problems were actually caused by Windows rather than these memory configuration issues. Now the reason he thought to do this was because the 29WX gets good performance in Linux but not in Windows so it does seem to be a software problem rather than a hardware problem. So Epic has four memory controllers which is why it was chosen for this particular battery of tests in which you know if the issue was the memory controllers like I've already said that we wouldn't see the same results being duplicated here but on his results is pretty much what he found that on Linux, Threadripper and Epic did much, much better. So what is actually causing the problems in Windows, I hear you ask? Well, according to Wendell's findings, basically they took a look at the Windows internal thread management software and basically the threads being utilized by the Indigo benchmark, which is what they were using here, that basically was assigning a process to a particular core. Now normally this wouldn't be a problem but essentially what was going on here was that Windows was basically just throwing these threads around pointlessly and basically a bunch of power was being wasted just shuffling these threads around rather than assigning them to the most efficient place. And it wasn't going you there, you there and you there and that's it. It was moving things around kind of randomly and wasting a bunch of power and performance. Now some of it is undoubtedly the memory. The memory situation probably isn't helping because for example the 2990WX is still 22% slower in Windows than 7-zip, um, in 7-zip should I say, but the Windows problem isn't helping either. A lot of it is Windows, some of it's memory, but a lot of it is this Windows problem. I am very much giving you the, tech, uh, to the cliff notes of this here. I'm going to include, as I said, a link to his video in the description below this video. Go check it out. Um, he was a nice guy when I saw him in Texas, so you know, go check his video out. Anyway, let's move on, shall we, to our final topic of today, which is actually regarding Nintendo. Now what we have here is some very interesting comments made by the Nintendo president Shantaro Furukawa when speaking to Nikkei, which was translated then by Nintendo Everything. And according to the comments made by him, we may see Nintendo move away from home console development. Now he actually said, quote, We aren't really fixated on our consoles. At the moment we're offering a uniquely developed Nintendo Switch and its software, and that's we're basing on how we deliver the Nintendo experience on. That being said, technology changes. We'll continue to think flexibly about how to deliver that experience as time goes on. It has been over 30 years since we started developing consoles. Nintendo's history goes back even farther than that. And through all the struggles that they faced, the only thing that they thought about was to make next. In the long term, perhaps our focus as a business could shift away from home consoles. Flexibility is just as important as an as an ingenuity. And essentially what he's talking about here is Nintendo needing to sort of adapting to fluctuations in the industry and that he was quote thinking about little ways we can to reduce that kind of instability. And then went on to say that he would like Nintendo to improve their smartphone game development to secure a quote continuous stream of revenue and also speculate a little bit on how they're looking into theme parks, movies and all that sort of thing. So what does this mean? Does it mean they're going to be becoming purely handheld? I mean, we have seen with the Switch the sort of direction that they wanted to go in and how that flexibility of that system has really, I think, been one of the reasons that it's sold so well because it's both a home console and a handheld. So, you know, if you were in the middle of playing, you know, Zelda or whatever, you could just take it with you on that long car trip you've got coming up, that sort of thing. And that flexibility, I think, has really been one of the key selling points of the Switch. 
as well as the fantastic games library as well of course so will we see more things like that where we're not seeing a strict home console perhaps will we see them go to way more into the mobile probably I and mean, we've not really seen them do that well in the mobile space to be honest because they continue to just be well nintendo makes some odd decisions sometimes like making that mario game like require access to the internet i'm like if i'm playing that on the train to work that is literally meaningless to me like i cannot play that because i'm going to lose my connection that sort of thing so they definitely need to kind of adapt to the industry you know we have seen them kind of bring themselves into the current century with their improvement of their youtube policy and that sort of thing so perhaps we're kind of seeing a sort of newer more sort of plugged in nintendo as it were so we could see them move more into smartphones we could see them go to a pure handheld thing or we could just see them becoming a software developer only i don't see them doing that but it's entirely possible that they'll just um, license out their software to other companies i don't predict that happening but it is definitely possible but what i think we're going to be seeing is either them go sort of full handheld route or make flexible things like the switch because that seems to be the key of what he's saying here but of course it's going to be a link in the description below this video to the nintendo everything article where you can read the into if you so desire so interesting what do you think this means for the future of nintendo i definitely am curious to see where they go after the switch because that's definitely going to be a tough act to follow, given that it has just done insanely well for itself, and rightfully so. So, let me know your thoughts on these ones, guys. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.